everybody, Phil Lee returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. Today is Tuesday, the 18th of January, 2022. Click on the subscribe button below here and also the notification bell in the far upper right to be notified when new uh, episodes are released. Uh, today's presentation is going to be a PowerPoint presentation. It's about a Confederate infantry uh, hero, Barry Benson. I made a speech uh, that I'm going to be presenting this on PowerPoint, and it's essentially a speed up speech that I made on Lee Jackson Day in Augusta, Georgia, just a couple of days ago. So what I'd like to do now is to um, share my screen and pull up the uh, PowerPoint. And then do the slideshow. Okay. Together with his 16 year old brother, Blackwood, Barry Benson enlisted in the 1st South Carolina Infantry Regiment three months before the opening shots at Fort Sumter, when he was one month shy of his 18th birthday. After Sumter, the two sons of a cotton broker served in Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia until war's end. Both refused to participate in the Appomattox surrender and returned to their Augusta, Georgia home after learning that Confederate General Joe Johnston had also surrendered in North Carolina. They were still armed with their rifles when they arrived home. Barry missed Gettysburg because he was wounded two months earlier at the Battle of Chancellorsville but otherwise participated in all of Lee's major campaigns. He was twice captured and twice escaped no notorious prison camps, Point Lookout, Maryland, and Elmira, New York. When the brothers rode home, they customarily asked to be remembered to the family's two slaves. After the war, Barry championed the cause of a Jewish Northerner accused of a 1913 murder in Atlanta and stood as a model for, the, for Augusta's 76-foot memorial to the ordinary Confederate soldier erected in 1878. Augusta's Ladies Memorial Association obtained some of the donations via a benefit performance by the all-black colored, uh, colored cotton states minstrels. Both brothers became prosperous businessmen. Barry tried to get his Civil War book memoir published in the mid 1880s, but New York publishers turned it down as too, quote, Southern, close quote. Blackwood, however, got four novels published. The most popular, titled Who Goes There, is about a Union soldier. Shocked into amnesia during a battle, the soldier unknowingly switches sides before becoming a spy as his memory slowly returns. A shortened version of Barry's memoir, edited by his daughter-in-law, was finally published in 1962 by the University of Georgia. Together with private Sam Watkins's company H, it is one of the most absorbing memoirs of a Confederate enlisted man I've ever read. While Watkins sometimes lapsed into tall tales, Benson's story is more verifiable. Since their six month enlistment expired in July, 1861, the brothers missed the first big battle and Confederate victory at first Manassas on July 21st. They instead emerged as veterans after seven days of nearly continuous fighting in pursuit of Lincoln's biggest army on the York James Peninsula below Richmond in late June, 1862. Afterward, their regiment joined Stonewall Jackson's Corps of Lee's army. Lee deployed it as bait to trick the Union Army near Washington into attacking Jackson, while Lee positioned his other corps for a supply, surprise flank attack that routed the, the Yankee Army at the Battle of Second Manassas in late August, 1862. Next, Lee resolved to force a showdown battle in Maryland or Pennsylvania, where a decisive victory might end the war altogether. He marched his army 
so rapidly that many soldiers began to straggle, including Barry. After lagging uh, for several days, Barry could go no, go no farther on September 5th as the army approached a Potomac River Ford near Poolsville, Maryland. After he dragged into the company campsite the prior night, his captain urged that he stay behind until he got well, until he recovered. The next morning, his memoir records, I fell in with the rest of the company, but had to drop out after going only 20 yards. After the company marched off, I couldn't stand to see them go along the road. So I set my course on a large house about a mile away across some fields and I crept slowly across the field, stopping often to rest. About midday at the halfway point, I thought I'd never complete the journey. I stuck my ramrod into the ground and tied a handkerchief at the top of it as a sign of distress, but nobody responded. Just before sunset, I finally lay down in the grass before the door of the farmhouse and was soon found. The ladies of stately old Judge Gary, uh, Gary's family put me to bed where I remained for five days. I took my leave on September 10th, despite their protests to stay. Barry promised the ladies he would return someday. A week after leaving them, he participated in General A.P. Hill's timely arrival and attack that saved Lee's army at the Battle of Sharpsburg, Maryland on September 17, 1862. He fought at Fredericksburg, Virginia in December, 1862 where General Lee repulsed Union attacks repeatedly. Finally, in May, 1863, Union General Joseph Hooker got the jump on Lee by crossing the Rappahannock River through its shallow Western Fords, flanking Lee's position at Fredericksburg. In response, Lee sent Stonewall Jackson on a 17 mile march for a surprise assault on Hooker's westernmost units. Due to the length of the march, Jackson's attack continued after darkness when he was accidentally shot by his own soldiers. Barry was in the fight and overheard the shots that fatally wounded John, uh, Jackson. The next day, Jackson's survivors and Lee's men attacked the Union forces that separated them until the two Confederate components united victoriously at Hazel Grove and the Union army retreated to the north side of the Rappahannock. During the fighting to reunite Lee's army at Chancellorsville, Barry took a bullet in the leg. Sent home to recuperate, he did not return until January 1864, thereby missing the July 1863 Battle of Gettysburg, as noted. He was, however, back in the ranks when Union General Ulysses Grant started his six-week Overland campaign to destroy Lee's army in the spring of 1864. That movement ended with a stalemate at Petersburg, Virginia, where Confederate fortifications guarded vital railroad connections for their capital at Richmond. Grant lost 64,000 Union soldiers compared to 30,000 for Lee. During the first battle of that game in the wilderness west of Fredericksburg, badly outnumbered Confederate unions, uh, units, including Berries, were temporarily thrown into headlong retreat on May 6, 1864. Here's how he described it. Down the slope we went, across a brook, up the field on the other side, halting only when General Lee rode up to our brigade commander, General Sam McAllen, exclaiming, I am surprised to see such a gallant brigade running like a flock of geese, close quote. No troops in the world could have withstood that reprimand. Our halt was immediate and decisive. During the campaign's second battle at Spotsylvania, Barry volunteered for a scout on May 16th. Lee anticipated that Grant was about to move his army, and he asked that all Confederate brigades provide the latest information on their fronts. Given only two hours to complete his mission that night, Barry felt compelled to risk going inside Union lines rather than lurk more safely behind them. Consequently, he was captured and threatened with execution as a spy, notwithstanding his Confederate uniform. Fortunately, the enemy 
ultimately judged him to be a war prisoner instead of a spy and sent him to Point Lookout, the Point Lookout, Maryland prison camp where the Potomac River flows into Chesapeake Bay. The camp with trains were located in boxes about 25 feet from shore and accessed over crude gangways. After a new guard detail neglected to lock the gates to, the, to those latrines at nightfall, Barry resolved to escape by swimming. On May 25, 1864, he started tiptoeing and swimming upstream about 40 yards from the north bank of the Potomac River. After going ashore, he spent five days sneaking along the bank, alternately stealing and begging for food until he reached a point 20 miles downriver from Washington City. That night, he crossed the Mile Wide River with the aid of two planks he had roped together. After almost being swept under by a passing boat, he arrived on the Virginia shore. Since Northern Virginia was occupied at that time, as it is now, by Union people, and in this case, Union soldiers, after six days of freedom, he was recaptured on May 31st, 1864. Threatened again with execution as a spy, he was fortunately instead scheduled to be sent to the Elmira, New York prison camp. But first, he was caged with 600 other soldiers in a Washington jail from June 5th to July 23rd. During that time, a small Confederate army under Major General Jubal Early skirmished with Union troops on the outskirts of the capital city. The prisoners heard the cannon fire and hoped that Early would capture Washington, but the rebel army was too small. While thus jailed, Barry also met members of Confederate Colonel John Mosby's legendary command. Mosby's Rangers persistently launched surprise attacks on Union targets near Washington before fading like ghosts as they returned to their homes where they were worked in, in disguise as ordinary citizens, and farmers, civilians. Mosby's force was never subdued during the entire war. Barry arrived at the, uh, on July 24th at the Elmira prison camp. He soon fell in with a group of 10 prisoners who were tunneling out. On August 29th, they planned the, a planned escape night. Barry got two surprises. First, the tunnel unexpectedly did not extend beyond the prison fence. Second, Yankee guards discovered it and destroyed it. The men started a second tunnel that became a Civil War version of The Great Escape, a movie from 1963 about uh, prisoners escaping from a um, German prisoner of war camp during World War II. Diggers were constantly in, endangered by asphyxiation. When they finally probed the surface to form an escape hatch, they learned they were again short and off course to the right. Upon reflection, they realized that the tunnel's curve resulted from the fact that most of the men were digging with their right hands while laying on their sides with their backs to the left wall. By correcting for the right hand digging and developing diversionary ways to measure the tunnel's progress from above ground, the 65 foot shaft was ready for uh, an escape on October 6, 1864, 10 weeks after Barry had arrived in Elmira. It proved to be Elmira's only successful escape. While his buddies headed for Canada and out of the war, Barry tried to rejoin his regiment. 11 days later, he crossed the Potomac River into Virginia at a ford upstream from Washington. He traveled by a combination of foot, horseback, rowboat, and rowboat, as well as by hitching rides on passenger and freight trains. After arriving in Virginia, he called upon the Gray family that had helped him two years earlier. They no longer lived in the farmhouse, but had moved into the town of Leesburg. Although no longer prosperous or as prosperous as they were, they gladly offered what food they could spare. Determined to get back to his regiment in Petersburg, he soon departed. After asking for permission to bed in a barn along the way, he learned that the owner of the barn was temporarily lodging some of Mosby's men. 
Having gathered for a raid set for the following morning, the Rangers questioned Barry suspiciously until he named some of the, their members that he had met while jail, jailed in Washington. Thereafter, they were fascinated by his story and urged that he join their unit, which he would have done had he had a horse, which he didn't. Three weeks after arriving in Elmira, Barry walked into a Confederate Army campsite in the Shenandoah Valley on October 27th, 1864. 23 weeks after first being captured at Spotsylvania. Shortly thereafter, he arrived in Petersburg to rejoin his regiment and brother Blackwood. Since the armies were generally inactive during the winter, Barry was furloughed home in December, 1864. When he got home, the town feared that Sherman would divert his 60,000 Union, uh, 60, man Union, Union Army from its so-called march to the sea and attack Augusta to capture the city's massive gunpowder works. Sherman, however, was more anxious to take Savannah than Augusta because at Savannah, he could reestablish a supply line since his army had been living off of civilian forage throughout most of November and December, 1864. Growing bored in Augusta, Barry took a train to Savannah, to Savannah to help defend that city, which Confederates abandoned on December 23rd. He temporarily returned to Augusta before leaving on January 17, 1865 to rejoin Lee's 50,000 troops at Petersburg, where they were opposed by Grant's 120,000. This, uh, if I can just take a minute, uh, if you want to get a book that describes some of these incidents, uh, I, here's The Confederacy at Flood Tide by me. You can get it at Amazon, Barnes and Noble. If you want an autograph copy, contact me and uh, I'll, I'll sell you an autograph copy. I think it's uh, $31 for an autograph copy, $28 for a uh, regular uh, hardback or paperback copy. Then those are available at Amazon and Barnes and Noble. If you like my books, then please give them a five-star rating. It really helps us out. If Barry and Blackwood fought as sharpshooters until Lee's army surrendered on April 9th. After Barry got back in January, 1865, they fought all the way till April 9th. But obviously Barry had developed an allergy to prisons and he did not linger to learn the surrender terms that might happen at Appomattox, but instead took Blackwood to join General Joe Johnston's army in North Carolina. By the time they reached Johnston, they learned that he had also surrendered. Still holding their rifles, the brothers returned home where Barry's infield is presently displayed at the Augusta Museum of History. After the war, both Barry and Blackwood became prosperous businessmen. Blackwood moved to Texas, where the cotton yields were better. In addition to the novels noted earlier, he authored textbooks for the state's public schools. Barry married a local girl in 1868, meaning local, meaning an Augusta girl, and eventually became the dominant auditor for Augusta's textile mills. Near the end of the 19th century, he patented a fail-safe method for catching errors, termed the, quote, zero system, close quote. He eventually licensed the system to accountants throughout North America. It remained popular until the advent of the adding machine. Before enlisting in the Confederate Army, Barry had been a good student, and some of his intellectual skills became evident in the postbellum years. When he lost an adult spelling bee to the other finalist whose version of conjurer was documented in Webster's dictionary, Barry conceded the contest but stated that Webster's was wrong. He later sent the publisher a list of 37 corrections, including conjurer, which were put into the next edition. He also developed an interest in cryptography and broke a reputedly unbreakable French military code in 1896. When he wrote President Cleveland's War Secretary, Daniel Lamont, to inform him of the deed, Lamont responded with a test. He sent Barry four 
cryptograms in the United States military code. Barry easily translated them and even corrected some errors. When Republican William McKinley took office and entered the Spanish-American War, Barry patriotically offered his cryptography services to the war department, or I should say his cryptography capabilities. He didn't have anything to sell. But the Republican bureaucrats crashly assumed he was trying to sell them something, and they just wrote back saying they declined to buy it. Despite his income dependence on Augusto's textile mills, he sided with workers during the 1898-99 labor dispute. It started with a worker strike and evolved into an owner lockout. When the owners threatened to evict workers from company housing in January 1899, Barry wrote a letter to the local newspaper pledging to donate all of the zero system fees from the Augusta Mills to a fund for the benefit of workers. When the mills eventually agreed to meet with union representatives, the workers asked Barry to be one of their arbiters. Eventually, Augustus Mills agreed to pay salaries 6% higher than those in neighboring South Carolina. Barry's humanitarian concerns extended to black farmers, causing him to take an interest in the plentiful mushrooms uh, around Augusta that, Augusta that might become cheap food sources to poor families. He cataloged nearly 20 safe varieties. But it is Barry's role in the 1913 Leo Frank case that puts today's progressive academic historians on the horns of dilemma. If they praise him, they risk accusations of glorifying a Confederate who would be presumably racist. But if they condemn him, they may be criticized for anti-Semitism because Barry stood up for a Jewish man accused of the murder, Leo Frank. Frank was a Cornell educated uh, engineer who moved to Atlanta in 1908. When he was 24 years old, two years later, he married a local girl in and in 1910 was elected president of Atlanta, Atlanta's chapter of B'nai B'rith, a Jewish service organization. While he was manager of a local pencil factory in 1913, a 13-year-old girl worker was found murdered in the basement. A month later, Frank was charged with the murder and convicted after a 25-day trial. Barry followed the trial from Augusta with interest because he knew attorney William Smith who represented a key prosecution witness, a black janitor named Jim Conley. Smith had been, a boy, had been boyhood friends with Barry's son, Charles. Notwithstanding Smith's sympathy for black civil rights, partly learned under Barry's mentorship, Barry doubted Conley's testimony. Conley claimed that Frank paid him $200 in cash the very night of the murder as hush money and to assist in the body disposal. The confession earned him a light sentence. As an accountant, Barry felt $200 was too much money for a factory manager to have on hand on a Saturday night. He traveled to Atlanta and together with Smith questioned Conley. After checking the books, Smith learned that the factory had only $26 in cash on hand the night of the murder. Upon further investigation, Barry concluded that the victim could not have arrived at the factory as early as Conley testified. He also discovered other exculpatory evidence favoring Frank. After returning to Augusta, he corresponded with Frank and published a pamphlet at his own expense detailing, quote, five arguments, close quote, that questioned the prosecution's case. That put him in a media duel with Tom Watson, a newspaper man and former congressman convinced of Frank's guilt. Eventually, Governor Slayton commuted Frank's death sentence to life imprisonment, expecting that he could pardon Frank when tempers cooled. To better protect Frank, the governor ordered him removed to Milledgeville, the state's former capital. Watson became enraged and published an article demanding an investigation of the governor's action. Consequently, a vigilante group formed in the girl's hometown, caravan to Milledgeville, 
broke into the town, took Frank back to the girl's hometown and lynched Leo Frank on August 17, 1950. Now, many people, there's nobody knows whether Frank really committed that murder or not. There are still two sides to this argument. I don't know if Barry was right or wrong. Some people still are convinced, as I say, of the guilt of Frank. Others that he feel that he was, uh, you know, a victim of uh, racial prejudice or religious prejudice. During World War I, Barry wrote President Woodrow Wilson, an Augusta, quote, boy, close quote, to a man of Barry's age. Wilson had grown up in Augusta. Anyway, Barry pledged his support for the war to the president. Learning that it had orphaned, the war had orphaned hundreds of French children, Barry volunteered to pay for the care of five and persuaded other, uh, others in town to support another 155. At the time, this was, this was uh, labeled adoption, but it wasn't a formal legal adoption, but it's the money they paid to take care of them during the war. While conducting the financial transactions, he learned that the official dollar to franc exchange ratio did not match the market rates. Now today, that taking advantage of that would just be characterized as arbitrage, which is what it is. But in those days, it was considered kind of a, a dubious way of making money. And so in July, 1919, he wrote the Massachusetts Attorney General that a man named Charles Ponzi appeared to be uh, arranging just such a scheme in his state and profiting from it. So um, when he alerted the Massachusetts Attorney General, he contributed to the collapse of the notorious Ponzi scheme. He also compiled a list of personal proverbs available on the internet under, quote, Barry Benson outlines. You might want to look at it. Here's one example. A child asked me, what is water? I said, it is one part oxygen and two parts hydrogen. Said he, but what is water? It's like the boy who asked his mom, why do airplanes fly? And she said, well, go ask your dad. He said, mom, I don't want to know that much about why airplanes fly. In his last year at age 79, Barry participated in a Confederate parade in Richmond. He marched, as during the war, in a torn woolen uniform, lacking underwear, with his rifle on his shoulder. As the parade was about to start, a young lady called out from behind, won't you come ride with us in our automobile? Why well, no, answered Barry. I am ordered to march alone in advance of the brigade with my rifle. You'd better come and march along with me, he joked. But to Barry's surprise, she said, well, I will. And the two marched together the whole way with her right arm under his left. Okay, there is the last picture, Barry marching. He, he died, uh, th that was his last year. He, he died on January 1st, 1923, after merely a one day illness. So let me stop sharing here and return. Okay, thank you for watching. That's our show for today and I look forward to seeing you next time.